Welcome back to the program. This is Bottom Line Africa with me, Yusuf Ibrahim. Now, uh, let me take you over to Sierra Leone, where for 23 years, Sierra Leone's Takugama Sanctuary has been a safe haven for chimpanzees. While cases of trafficking have reduced, conservationists warned that encroachment on the primates' habitat poses a potentially greater threat. Most of them are orphaned or separated from their family by wildlife traffickers, poachers or bushmeat traders across the country. At Takugama, the chimps are resocialized and introduced to new families, a delicate process open to a mix of their complex cognitive abilities and traumatic past. Researchers say chimpanzees are closely related to humans and share many behavioral, mental and social capabilities. They are also classified as an endangered species because their population are under threat from poaching and destruction of natural habitats. The chimpanzees we have here are coming from different parts of the country. It's not like they are from the same family group. Mind you, chimpanzees live in a group of 30 and above. And all chimpanzees coming from the east, the west, the north, and south, we bring them here in the sanctuary. And in trying to form them back in a group, it takes a long process. Bringing them in a sanctuary like this, it's kind of like a, he a heaven for them. And Coming here, they have a lot of psychological problems. So dealing with their psychological problems is all part of the rehabilitation uh, process. We are in the spend a minimum period of 90 days in the quarantine area. We are in, they are properly checked for all medical issues. And some of them spend a minimum a, a time above the 90 days because of their psychological problems or their wounds or fragments or bullet wounds that they have in their, in their body. It takes time for them to recover. Now, speaking about animals, the biggest animal welfare conference in Africa themed People, Animals and Planet, One Health, One Welfare is happening at the United Nations complex, complex right in Nairobi. The conference is co-hosted by African Network for Animal Welfare, that is ANO, and United Nations Environment. There have been efforts by civil society to support governments across Africa to implement the animal welfare strategy for Africa through the Africa Platform for Animal Welfare. Moreover, environmental matters, especially pollution has been identified as a factor influencing human and animal welfare. Now this time studio, Hafka Hindi Lekal Hailo is the Director of Public Affairs of the African Network for Animal Welfare is with me in studio. Kahindi, good to see you. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Before we even talk about the conference and perhaps what is your what your main agenda will be this time around, I believe this is the fourth conference that yeah. is happening in Nairobi. That's correct. Can you perhaps tell us some of the initiatives that you've made as, as an organization to make sure that you know animals animal welfare is taken care of? Anim, uh, African Network for Animal Welfare is a civil society organization mm -hmm. uh, registered in Kenya as a non-governmental organization in the year 2007. Mm -hmm. And our job has actually been mainly to try and prevent cruelty amongst animals and also to alleviate stress mm -hmm. uh, in addition to try and support medical as well as animal health programs. Mm -hmm. Now, our organization believes that animal health is also about people. So when we tackle um, animal welfare issues, we are actually addressing people people's welfare directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most important thing is that we work directly with governments, mm -hmm. communities, and the private sector. Yeah. Like, Ayla, I'm sure when people talk about animal welfare, the first thing that crosses their mind is wild animals, endangered animals. But you don't just cover wild animals alone. You also, you also take care of domestic animals, right? Yeah. Actually, uh, we cover all, all animals. Mm -hmm. And um, animal welfare is not just about wild animals. It's yeah. about all animals. And I'll give you um, some instance. There is a lot of interaction between people, wild animals, 
domestic animals, the environment in which people live, as well as the other natural environment. For mm -hmm. instance, um, a rabid dog usually gets rabies from a hyena, mm -hmm. and um, rabies has no cures. So when you're beaten by a dog mm -hmm. and you don't get quick inoculation for rabies, then you will actually die because rabies virus is the closest relative to a rabies virus is actually Ebola. Mm -hmm. So um, if you are able to inoculate dogs against um, uh, rabies so that at least when they're bitten by hyenas, they mm -hmm. don't transmit that to people, you are saving people's lives. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, you should be addressing the hyenas welfare to ensure that uh, it is not only um, kept far away from people, mm -hmm. but it can actually be prevented from biting people. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of issues, those are the kind of interactions that animal welfare finds itself in. So by taking care of the hyena, you've avoided all these other problems? By making mm -hmm. sure that you inoculate dogs mm -hmm. against rabies, mm -hmm. which is something that a lot of communities don't even have access to, you are actually preventing deaths, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, suffering uh, in human communities. Mm -hmm. And that's why we say that um, animal welfare and human welfare mm -hmm. is intric intricately connected uh, to that of the environment as well. Mm -hmm. So by taking care of animal welfare, mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. also taking care of Kenya, The fact that we have a lot of stray dogs, not just in Kenya, but in most African countries, I mean, what does that say about animal welfare in this continent um, because that, that's not something that you get to see in other in other countries interestingly mm -hmm. in Kenya it's illegal to kill stray dogs even by baiting mm -hmm. it's now illegal um, and um, that is um, an animal welfare standard mm -hmm. um, stray dogs arise from uh, poor um, care and management at home mm -hmm. and um, we normally use the word stray dog, but most dogs have owners. Mm -hmm. You know, only that um, the owners don't feed them or take care of them properly, or they suffer stress and suffering at home, and they basically so they end up freedom for themselves out, yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, um, dogs interact with others, and when they interact with others, they find better company. And uh -huh. one of the things that dog always, dogs always look for mm -hmm. is better company. Interestingly, mm -hmm. people who are friendlier to dogs, even if they don't give them enough food, mm -hmm. the dogs actually stay closer to them mm -hmm. because dogs really are loyal and they can read the minds of the owners. So um, mm -hmm. stray dogs mm -hmm. issue can be solved um, in, in two ways. One, uh, first and foremost, giving basic animal care education to the owners. Mm -hmm. But secondly, uh, introducing what you would uh, refer to as family planning for mm -hmm. dogs and cats uh, through spaying and neutering mm -hmm. uh, those particular animals. Uh, it may uh, sound uncruel, but at least uh, it reduces the tendency for those animals to reproduce mm -hmm. you know, uh, in an unplanned manner. Uh, the bottom line here is mm -hmm. improving the relationship between the domestic animal owners and uh, the owners themselves will actually reduce the propensity you know, of um, Dogs and well said, Nekele. Talk us through about the need to conserve environment because uh, from what we've read earlier, uh, pollution has been identified as, as um, one of the major factors that is influencing, you know, human and, you know, animal welfare. There are different kinds of pollution. There's mm -hmm. air, land and water. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, in all those spheres of the environment, you find animals. Uh, when you pollute the air, then birds actually die. Mm -hmm. Birds are one of the best indicators mm -hmm. of a healthy environment. When you pollute water, you are not actually polluting the human, you know, um, um, safety you are uh, uh, also affecting a lot of animals there, same as land. Now, um, in Garissa, for example, um, a lot of people supported the ban on plastics because of how much um, plastics, cattle, and goats were eating. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of livestock from pastoral areas being brought for slaughter to slaughterhouses, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to slaughter them for human consumption. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about 5 to 9% of them have plastics in their gut. So that not only affects the um, 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 health of the animal that we are about to eat, but it also introduces pathogens that can actually end up on our plate. You so know, it's so a health concern for the people so who you are consuming this. So, so mm -hmm. when you pollute any of those uh, environmental spheres, Mm -hmm. We are actually polluting ourselves indirectly through the animals mm -hmm. because eventually what the animal eats, whether it's fish, birds or cows, will actually end up in our plate. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are seeing an increase in cancer cases, mm -hmm. you know, all over the place. So by taking uh, care and control of pollution, coming up with standards that actually said that, we are not just helping animals and the environment, mm -hmm. but we are actually helping ourselves. As a network for animal welfare, perhaps one will ask what are some of the initiatives that you've already undertaken to make sure that, you know, these animals are well taken care of? Are there punitive measures that you think, uh, you know, people have been brought to justice? We've seen a lot of cruelty happening, you know, 
know, to animals, especially in this country? Yeah, we, we have about four uh, major uh, spheres that we normally uh, work on. Mm -hmm. One is um, building capacity of law enforcement, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to animal law. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, at the conference we're having right now, mm -hmm. we have a whole breakout on um, animal law, mm -hmm. where people are actually coming to know how to enforce the law, mm -hmm. and not only that, but how to improve the uh, judicial value chain. Mm -hmm. Our organization has uh, been instrumental in bringing all the actors together, sometimes to enlighten them on what the gaps are in enforcing the law, mm -hmm. and how they can actually work together and collaborate in ensuring you know, that uh, animal law is actually enforced. Mm -hmm. We're talking about wildlife, and we're talking about domestic animals. Yes. In Kenya, we have a mm -hmm. law called mm -hmm. the Prevention of Animal Cruelty, CAP 360, mm -hmm. that prevents animal cruelty. Like, for example, mm -hmm. the way you see uh, chicken and uh, goats being carried and transported from one place to the, uh, to the other mm -hmm. um, is actually against that law. If we are to enforce that, mm -hmm. you will not see that on our roads again. The, a quick one. Uh, you have less than a minute. To, unfortunately, we're out of time. Can you That's perhaps good. summarize for us what is the main agenda for this, uh, for this conference? The main agenda is to bring experts together, mm -hmm. our pra practitioners as well as students, to talk about the uh, connections between animals, mm -hmm. uh, the environment, and people, and to see what the case studies have been, mm -hmm. to share ideas on those experiences, but, not to, but, but, but also to take those um, uh, experiences and um, lessons to other parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. We have about um, 39 countries represented mm -hmm. you know, in this particular conference, and we hope uh, it will be a wonderful outcome that can lead us to the next conference, because mm -hmm. these kind of talk shops are important, yes. first and foremost to create public awareness, mm -hmm. but also to improve um, the setting of standards and help policymakers um, make policies that are relevant and important uh, to animal welfare. Kaindi Lekel Heile, many thanks for your input. He's the Director of Public Affairs of the African Network for Animal Welfare, and you've heard him there. You know, how we treat our animals is a reflection of how we are as a society. Now, the African Union mission in Somalia, that is AMISOM, is offering free corrective surgery to individuals with cleft, cleft lip and uh, palate deformities in Kismayo, that is in Somalia. The two-week medical camp being held at Kismayo General Hospital plans to benefit more than 100 patients in Jubaland State alone. AMISOM doctors are conducting the surgeries in partnership with international cleft lip charity, Smile Train and Washington-based company Bancroft Global development cleft lip and palate is a condition that occurs when a baby's lip or mouth does not form fully during pregnancy it can either be a small or large opening that goes through the lip to the nose making feeding and speaking difficult speaking in Kismayo the team leader that is dr. Colonel James Kiyongo said the medical camp will benefit both children and adults he expressed hope that the medical camp will reduce the pain and stigma suffered by people with the deformity in Somalia So these cleft lips are a problem because the child cannot play with other children, he cannot go to school, he's not comfortable with neighbors, and when he grows up, he can't marry or get married. And after that, he can't even work because some people cannot employ him. So when we do one cleft lip, we solve a problem for the family of the child. He can get employment, so his family he's going to make will also exist and also get supported. I brought him from Bula Haji town, located 90 kilometers from Kismayo, and thanks to God, his operation was successful, and I hope he will get even better. There's noticeable change, because initially this place, the lip was open, but it has been corrected. I expect a lot more improvement, but as of now, he's healthy and will get better. Now, over half of the world's refugees of school-going age are not getting an education. A school enrollment is failing to keep pace with growing displacement worldwide, according to the United Nations. Now, four million refugee children around the world do not attend school, an increase of half a million from a year earlier. The United Nations Refugee Agency, that is UNHCR, said in a report more than 500,000 refugee children were newly enrolled in school last year, but the rapidly growing refugee population means the proportion missing out on education has not shrunk. Only 61% of refugee children attend primary school, compared to 92% of children globally. 
and as the children get older, the gap grows. I feel so good about going to school. If I become a doctor, I will be able to help people. Now, a new mobile phone app using satellite images is helping Maasai cattle herders in Kenya find rich pastures and water in the drought-stricken terrain. The device also tells them places to avoid to reduce encounters with wild animals. Faith Lapidas has details. In Kenya's Bobisa village, Ali Gufu and his companions lead a herd of camels from a watering site to a grazing camp. The 42-year-old father of three inherited nomadic pastoralism from his forefathers, but he cares for his animals with a 21st century tool, a smartphone app called AfriScout. Initially, we used to travel a lot by ourselves looking for pasture, but from February this year, we have started knowing AfriScout, whereby some of our guys know how it is used, and that information is helping us. We can now get pasture without much struggle. Now we are coming from the water point, and we are going home early because we know where the better pasture is. AfriScout was designed by Project Concern International, a U.S.-based nonprofit organization. It estimates Africa's 225 million pastoralists are on average losing a quarter of their herds each year. The app helps direct them toward rich pasture and water and away from carnivorous animals and other sources of danger. We are able to know where to find better pasture, where to find water and where there are no diseases. Competition for grazing land sometimes led to fatal inter-community clashes. But since the herdsmen started using the app six months ago, there's been a dramatic reduction in violence and a surge of positive collaboration. They've set up grazing committees that have drawn up a year-long grazing plan. In one Maasai village, the elders use the app to subdivide their pasture land into permanent settlement sections and an open community grazing field. By encouraging planned grazing patterns, PCI official Brenda Wandera says the system also helps reduce the impacts of climate change. So through Af the AfriScout application, pastoralists are able to see how the rangelands are looking like, and in that way they can only move their livestock to places where the forage has rejuvenated enough and avoid the areas that have been degraded. And by avoiding the areas that have been degraded, they give these spaces a time to rejuvenate. And as the land is rejuvenating, then through the information they have received on, from AfriScout, they are able to manage the rangelands properly and in that way contribute to the reduction of the effects of climate change. PCI has also introduced the app in Ethiopia and Tanzania. Well, that story on a new mobile app and how it's helping the Maasai cattle herders in Kenya brings us to the end of the program. Many thanks for watching. My name is Joseph Ibrahim. Of course, you'll be watching Bottom Line Africa right in KT News. I'll leave you with our images of the day as well as, as, well as the proverb of the day. Bye-bye for now.
высвечивать очень This is KTN News.